who may be the one that reaches out to someone else that is hurting and searching and lost. You may be the goodness of God. And there's a place where we can actually go and meet with him and share that in the goodness. Leah's going to uh, sing about that. Man, you can be seated. His love really is unfailing. And, um, yeah. Man, he, he's the best example of love you'll ever find. In your seat in front of you, there should be a, uh, except if you're on the front row, uh, there should be a uh, QR code you can scan if you'd like so you can follow along on our website. Hashtag struggles. This is week number four. We're going to talk about compassion. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about rediscovering rest uh, in this fast paced world. But today, we're talking about compassion. When you look on the internet and you find, uh, you see all of these different things that people are wanting to raise awareness about, they're 
wanting to raise money or they're wanting to tell a story or they're wanting to uh, do something like that. Those things come and they go. They're, they're, they're hot and then they're not. It was just a few years ago. Time, time means nothing to me a lot of times, so maybe it's longer than that. But the, just a few years ago, everybody was doing an ice bucket challenge on the internet, okay? Uh, you can just post that and call my name out all you want. Um, it does not help Lou Gehrig's disease be fault for me to get ice dumped on my head. I'm just not going to do it, okay? Maybe it's possible, it may be likely, I'm actually the one, the reason that you no longer see that on the internet. Since I stopped the chain, Jesus doesn't love me, and I... You haven't ever gotten those texts? If you don't send this to seven of your friends and Jesus doesn't really, you don't, you don't really love Jesus and you're going to split the pit and all this, you know, okay. Maybe I stopped the ALS ice bucket challenge, I'm not sure. But it's just, have you noticed also that it seems as though that we don't hear much about the Russia and Ukraine war anymore? Did it stop? But you see, it's just no longer cool. There's, oh, uh, yeah, slowly walk away. Oh. Maybe it's like somebody's actually trying to control the information. Oh, sorry, I'm just not going to say that. University of Michigan a few years ago did a study over about 30 years of four, approximately 14,000 college students asking, and, and they found a sharp decline in empathy. It said we care 40% less than people did in the 80s. And three of you said, wow, because you don't care. <laughs> I got you. So how did we come to these numbers? Well, on a scale of one to five, they, this is one of the questions they asked, or this is one of the comments they said, give us a scale of one to five. I sometimes try to understand friends better by looking at their perspective. Here's another one. I often have tender, concerned feelings about less fortunate than me. And we're finding that we care 40% less. I, fewer call themselves soft-hearted. Other misfortunes don't bother us so much. Now, I'm going to tell you this. The drop in uh, compassion coincides directly with the rise in social media and technology. You know why we don't notice that some people are hurting? One, we're not looking. Let me say it differently. We're not present. Yeah. Man, I'm sorry. I usually give you all a couple minutes to warm up and get your amens in. Didn't even do that today. So maybe we'll get one on the back end for you here, give you a chance. How does technology cause us to care less? We're asking that question. I got a couple of things I want to share with you. One is how does technology care, help, uh, cause us to care less? One, we're more obsessed with ourselves. I could have, I wish I would have, I could have pulled up about 10 different types of selfies that we could take. Yeah. Food selfie, drive-thru, uh, drive-thru restaurant selfie. We could do the duck lip selfie. I probably should have done that one myself. I mean, I, I, I do think I might should just go ahead. But anyway, we could have done the preaching selfie. Could have, uh, yesterday we could have done a pool selfie. I could have done a me and uh, half a million of my closest friends selfie with me and my honeybees yesterday. But social media increases the amount of dopamine that's released into our body. And we become addicted to a chemical that God put in there. Because we want it more and more and more. 80% of social media use is directly related to the person that's using. 
And we're feeding that. You see, what's happening is our bodies are rewarding us for focusing on ourselves. Well, that sounds biblical, doesn't it? Secondly, we got an overwhelming exposure to suffering and it's desensitizing us. Now, you, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Let me explain it to you. You, you see your friend at the local restaurant, you got your scrolling, your feed, and he, he's got a, a triple stack burger and got some fries next to it. The next picture you see is a football player that had his spinal cord severed while he was in an accident. The next picture is your grandkids going to Holiday World. The next picture is the Ukraine-Russian war. The next picture is someone's cat. Oh, isn't that so cute? The next picture is someone in, 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 in a Muslim country, a Christian maybe, that's in a Muslim country, the reporter that got beheaded. And our next picture is the pup, puppy next door. We're able to keep moving Some of you don't understand this. I understand. I'm good with that, but I'm going to talk to the rest of us. It's different when Walter Con Cronkite tells it to us. That's the only story. We got to listen to him. And he tells the story for as long as he wants to tell the story, and then he moves on to something else. Sometimes it's to a commercial so that it will just sink in. How many of you do not know who Walter is? Raise your hand. It's okay. I understand. I know how old you are. Just by that. Famous uh, news reporter. I could have used a different one, but you wouldn't have known him either. Thirdly, the lack of personal interaction makes it easier for us not to care. Is it easier to click on the like, to like the cat video, or your friend just lost their job? What I even... I don't, even know what to, I don't even know what to say. To, I'll just move. And a recipe for guacamole comes up and like, whoa, I've been trying to. And we've forgotten totally that our friend lost their job. Man. I just want to tell somebody right now, I'm really preaching good. If I was yelling, some people would like it and think I was really preaching it's easier to ignore suffering from a distance. It's hard, it's hard to do that when you're sitting at the same kitchen table. Or when you're sitting in their living room. You see, true compassion demands action. Now, I'm going to impress some of you. Some of you will not care less because you're a part of that 40%. Spaglinizoma. I'm going to say it seven more times. I'll never say it the same way. Each of the seven times, that's okay. It means to have your bowels yearn. To feel deep sympathy. To be moved to action. To say you care, but not act, is to not care at all. Instagram, should I click? Should I not click, click? Clicking is, caring is not a clicking. Caring is an acting. Caring is not liking a post. Caring is loving a person. Are we 
we kind of slowed her down here today, haven't we? Mark 1, 40 and 41, a man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. If you're willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. What's the next three words? Read it with me. Moved with spaglinazigamimia. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and pushed the like button. Jesus commented on his post, praying for you. Moved with compassion, he reached out and touched a leper who is unclean. And the priest had to go cleanse themselves for seven days in the Old Testament if they touched the leper. But Jesus said, what you have doesn't trump my compassion. I'm not scared. I will touch you. Remember when we didn't understand what AIDS was all about and no one would touch them? No, some of you don't, right? Yeah. <laughs> Matthew 14 to 14, when Jesus landed and saw a great crowd, he had compassion on them and healed them. Go ahead. He didn't say, thinking about you, I got you. No, no, he healed them. Matthew 20 and 34, Jesus had, help me, compassion on them and touched their eyes. And immediately they received their sight and followed him. You see, the more I obsess over social media, the more I care about me and the less I care about people. The closer I get to Jesus, the less I care about me and the more I care about people. When is the last time you gave out of compassion until it hurt. When is the last time we were moved so much to action and our action wasn't something that was easy? And it wasn't something that lasted four seconds. When is the last time you served someone else instead of doing what you wanted to do? When is the last time you changed your plans because compassion said, I've got to do something else. I've got to do something about that. It's time to get off work. Buddy's got a flat tire. And and, and trust me, that's about that much on that scale we're talking about right now. I got a better one for you. But it's time to get off work. And as you're walking out the door, your buddy said, yeah, I had a hard time at, at the house the last few weeks. I'll click the like button, though, buddy. I'll share it so somebody can take care of you. The last time you just put your hand over there and say, hey, 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 talk to me. What's going on? Oh, whoa, 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 Ben, what are you talking about? It's time to go home. Some of you, no doubt, it's been recently. I feel like there's some others in the room that maybe hadn't been quite as recent. If this is what Jesus did, can we say we're close to Jesus if we don't do what he does?
question. Just a question on an easy Sunday morning, Lionel. <laughs> Lionel Richie was not a preacher, and he was not a preacher in Ben's church. He was not a saint in Ben's church. So, because Sunday mornings aren't always easy. I got three points that I want to give you about compassion and what compassion does to us. First thing compassion does is compassion interrupts. Oh, Compassion interrupts. You see, I'm not reading these scriptures. I'm just telling you the context of them. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus had been preaching the gospel and the disciples had been preaching the gospel. And so they go someplace to rest. They go to a quiet place, but they realize that they couldn't stop at what they were doing and eat because there was a crowd there. And so they saw the crowd and they began to teach. Luke chapter 8, Jesus is on his way to heal a dying girl and there's a mob around him and a woman with an issue of blood crawls through the crowd and touches the bottom of his robe and Jesus says, hang on. Stops the parade for a little woman. I I said it like that because I feel like often where I'm going is a parade. Feels like there's just this, it's like I'm not even sometimes in charge of where we're going. It's just this mob of life predetermined. It's got, we got to do this, do this, do this, do this, go, go, go. When is the last time someone touched our heart to the point that we stopped what we were doing and turned around? Let me find out what just happened here. Mark chapter 2, Jesus is preaching to a packed house. Sheetrock begins to hit him in the head. And shingles. Okay, it's probably dirt. Begins to hit him in the head, and he's like, you understand, they don't back up to make room. They just put the man down on top of people, and people went out the doors because there was no room. What are you doing? I'm preaching. Quit interrupting my preaching. Why are you preaching? Why are you preaching the kingdom? Is it so you can hear your voice? Or is it so you can example the so you can example the kingdom? Because right now it's time to stop preaching and example the kingdom. Don't ever let the kingdom get in front of a good sermon. Frank didn't say today, he says it about every other Sunday or so. As always, these altars are always open. You can do that during the singing. Don't do it during the preaching because I'm up here. Right? Oh, don't interrupt the man of God. You can interrupt the musicians. It's okay. We would never want the kingdom to be played out until it's time for the invitation. Don't you know? That's when God moves. 10.58 to to 11 o'clock. Don't walk up at 11.01. We're done. God's done. He left. He's beating the the Pentecostals to lunch too. Matter of fact, he's just going to go and swing by their church because he didn't need to get there for then. Depending on which churches were, they could have started church, but nobody was there until about 30. My brother goes to England. Brother goes to England. He's there. He shows up. Yellow Pages back in that day. Yellow Pages. Look, see what time church starts. Church starts at 10 o'clock. He shows up about 5 till. There's a dude. There's one dude. Janitor in there vacuuming the sanctuary. So he and his wife walk in and he's back. The dude is vacuuming the sanctuary at church at five minutes to church time. No one in the room. So he goes and sits down. Janitor turns the vacuum off, walks over and says, hey, you're new here. He said, how'd you know? He said, because you're here at the time. We'll start about 11. But the yellow pages says 10. Yeah, God don't show up by then. 
So we figured that out. So we don't even know. He, he's like, yeah, we just, trust me, we don't show up. Because most of the crowd operated on their own time. And I've been told by some good friends of mine, it has to do with the pigment of your skin. And they had a different time frame and a different clock. And it happened to me when I was in South Africa. I'm like, what time's church? He said, what time's on the schedule? I said, no, what time do I got to be there? Oh, that's different. But we got to be careful to not let the kingdom and what God is doing get in way of what I'm doing. Compassion changes everything. Compassion interrupts our lives. Let me tell this real quickly. I heard a story of a preacher. Been preaching all, all week and went to, went to the airport. I think it was Kansas. Went to the airport and showed up at the airport. His flight's delayed. Yes. It's awesome. Don't get to go home like I planned. Goes and sits down. And as the universe would have it. A woman across from him says something. Hey, is your name? I called him by name. Yeah, it is. I go to your church. Different state. I go to your church. Oh, cool. Yeah, we're really struggling. I just found out. Or I, I've, sorry. We're really struggling. I've got to tell my husband that on this business trip I had an affair. And I really don't know what is going to happen. When I get home. Oh. Maybe we ought to talk for a second. He changed seats. Went over, sat next to her. Said, let's talk. Concluded this. At 10 a.m. This was a Friday. 10 a.m. Saturday morning. I want you to tell your husband. Because I'm going to be praying for you right at that time. Okay. He was at a soccer game with his kids, and it was his bell alarm rings on his phone. What, 10, 8, what is, why do, oh, I got to pray. So he got up, left, walked back behind the bleachers and started praying for this couple. Goes back, does his thing, finishes the game. Starts home. And something's in stir, and he goes, you can't go home right now. And he's like, okay, where am I, where am I going? So he swung through Walmart. Go to Walmart. So he goes into Walmart. Walks into Walmart. What am I doing in Walmart? So he's just walking around. He looks over at the fruit. And he turns, and there's a dude standing there with a kind of a dazed look on his face. And the guy looks at him and says, hey, you're my pastor. Really? Yeah. You're my pastor. So well, what are you doing here? Well, my wife was in Kansas this week. She saw you yesterday in an airport. And about 45 minutes ago, we had a talk. And I didn't know what to do, so I came to Walmart. And I was praying that God would send me somebody that could talk to me. You see, you got to pick for me, baby. You see, there's things we're doing there's times that we have life going on and I'm busy. I'm on a plane. I'm flying. I'm going. I got this going on. I got that going on. I got chickens to raise. I got rabbits to raise. I got bees to get stung by so y'all can have honey. I got life happening to me. I don't have time for one more thing on my plate. So she just emptied the plate. And then threw the plate in the floor and smiled and laughed and threw her hands up in the air like, ain't I cute? And I said, yes, you are, but you still make me mad. We don't have time. But compassion interrupts us. Compassion 
interrupts us. You see, if we're not careful, we're too rushed and we'll miss the blessings of God's divine interruptions. Can I say that one word you've gotten from the Lord? Can I say that? Is that fair? Can I say that one word that you have from the Lord about that? So we're praying about that situation that was just on your screen there. Trying to process and see what our role exactly is in that. And obviously it impacts her a whole lot more than it does me. And she said the the only thing that she's been able to get in in prayer and, and, and her thought process here and her trying to hear the Lord is this is an assignment. Now some assignments are shorter than others. So that didn't help much. It did help because we know God's involved. Okay? Um, second thing, and I've got, I got two points more and I'm going to be done. And our kids are coming in in just a second, so I'll trust that you can stay focused um, on what I'm doing. So we'll let nothing interrupt the Word of God and the man of God. Because it's... Second thing, what does compassion do? Compassion costs us. Compassion costs you. The good Samaritan went to the innkeeper and said, I'll, and gave him two days worth of wages. And then gave him, ex, gave him extra. And then said, if there's anything left when I'm done, when I come get him, I'll pay you that too. You see, compassion could cost you something. It's easy to drive, have drive-by Compassion. Because after all, it's the least and the easiest I could do. Hmm. I've commented, I've liked, I've favored it, I've shared. I poured ice on my head. I've done enough. Clicking is clean, compassion is complicated. What, what, what do you mean? Sometimes it's you got to mentor an inner city kid. And Leo's, Leo, you, well, yeah, you want to get scared. Start talking to some of these teachers, these staff people. She was telling me a story of a kid last, last, last well, the spring, I guess, spring, fall, uh, spring, end of pushing in the summer. And I was like, I mean, just the stuff that they deal with. They're not afraid to put right back up in your face. And you talk about having to be on your game. It's definitely a a calling. But what if God's called you not just to have a conversation with a child, but what if God's called you to mentor them? You've been through some stuff in your life. Why are you taking it with you? What if, it, what if God was calling you to go be Cliff Hagen's best friend at the Boys and Girls Club and start mentoring some kids? What if God's asking you to, you don't even, some of you don't even know we're doing this, to, to, uh, to coach a basketball team in our league this summer, this fall, winter, spring, I got them all done. Whenever we have it, that's what I'm talking about. The reason I write stuff down. And it's clear I did in that one. What if God sends you to mentor somebody and that somebody's been bullied or has been cutting themselves? What are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? What are you going to do if that child has more issues than a National Geographic? Take a seat. I'm, I thought I was going to be done, and I'm not. So I'm just going to keep on preaching. Be done here in just a second. You see, clicking is clean, but compassion isn't always so clean. Sometimes it's complicated. And the third one, last point, compassion changes lives. 
compassion changes lives. You see, the blind are healed. The hungry are fed. The naked get clothed and the broken get restored. We don't have a lot of time here to touch kids in a, in a church setting. You know, we, again, we did VBS last week, a uh, week, week and a half ago, and, and we had, you know, even two and a half hours each for two nights trying to teach them, trying to show them something. And in and, and Sunday school, we've got them for 45 minutes back there, and Wednesday night, we don't do much on Wednesdays. We just let them play, and, you know, it's, so we don't have a lot of time to touch those kids. Um, you got something for me, babe? So it, it, even from the standpoint of maybe even um, maybe even they we, two days it doesn't mean anything. Love him, love him in the morning, love him at the noontime. Love him, love him in the morning, love him at the noontime. What if two days is enough? What if two days is enough to change somebody's life? So one of them is nine, right? And one of them's two. Wrong? Seven and two? Okay, one of them's seven and one of them's two. The seven-year-old was here. The two-year-old wasn't even here. But she learned the song at home with her Where do you learn all your stuff from as a kid? From your brother or your sister. She learned it from her sister. And she's back there at two years old singing about serving Jesus. And the seven-year-olds too, that's awesome. But so my point is is that we don't have a lot of time, but when we got them, we're going to have to do something with them because compassion changes lives. You think it's not a big deal? Hey, Mm. you think it's not a big deal it's not you you need to fight you need to kick you need to scream you need to claw you need to do everything you can to get your kids through those doors your grandkids through those doors every single chance you can if they're not here they better be somewhere because they need to be learning about Jesus at a young age That's not just you being a grandparent or not just you being a parent. That's you being someone that has compassion and compassion changes lives. Better be careful. The life that gets changed might be yours. The life that gets changed might be yours. I'm finished. Let's stand. To care, to say we care, and to not act is to not care at all. To say we care and not act is to actually not care at all. You see, the more I care about social media, the more I care about me. But the more I care about Jesus, the closer I get to Jesus, the more I care about others. Compassion It's not about us. It's not about us. It's not about us. It's about somebody else. I'm going to let you in on a secret. This is only for this is only for for big people. So if you're not a big person, then just let it go on through. So glad you're here. Once you get here, once you get saved. When you get here and you're not saved, everything we do is about you and for you. Once you get saved, it's no longer about you. It's about the next person that needs to get saved. Oh, I'm going to do everything I can to disciple you and grow you and all those things. But 
if we're going to be about Jesus' business, he said he's about his father's business. He said he came for one reason. Why did he come? Scripture says, I came for one reason. And it was to seek and to save that which is lost. This isn't wrong, but hear me. And we get more programs for discipleship than we do for salvation. I'm not saying we don't need discipleship programs. Hear what I'm saying. But the scripture says there was one reason that Jesus came. And if we want to be like Jesus, I'm just going to leave that one sitting there for a minute. I feel like it's like a hand grenade or something. I'm thinking I'm just going to walk away. (laughs) Compassion interrupts. You're louder than they are. Let's bow our heads, would you please? Today, (laughs) this is this is fun. I know what I know. Some of what's about to happen right now, and so some of you don't. So I did it on purpose. To I want you to get. To, I want you to be blessed here. But first of all, if you've never given your heart to the Lord, you want Him to be your Savior. This is a beautiful opportunity today for that to happen. And if that's you, would you just slip your hand up wherever you are? Amen. All right. If you would like for me like for us to pray with you because sometimes it's not easy to have compassion sometimes it kind of gets in the way (laughs) sometimes it gets in the way of our life but you'd say you know what Ben I've heard the word of the Lord this morning I believe I need to I need to be able to slow down I just ask that that you'd pray with me that the Lord would help me slow down a little bit for those divine interruptions would you just lift your hand Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, that was funny. So that hand just went up kind of, kind of with an attitude like, okay, God. That was cool. And then in just a minute, if you're wanting to join our church, we'd love to have you come down front. But I want to pray first for everyone that raised their hand wanting some help with these divine interruptions, wanting compassion more in our lives. So let's pray. Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you for each heart, each person that's here in this room, each person that's watching online, whether it's today or tomorrow. I pray that you would touch every hand that was raised, the heart, the life behind it, Lord, that you would just let compassion grow in us. Every person in this room, God, I pray that you would just let us begin to overflow with compassion. Compassion for family, compassion for friends, compassion for the hurting, compassion for those that we don't know and will never add anything to our lives, but that we would have compassion for them. Pray that you would touch every, every one of us, Lord, to know that compassion interrupts. It costs us something, but it also changes lives. I pray that you would give us opportunities this week, divine appointments that became divine interruptions. We'd have an opportunity to show compassion this week somebody's life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing. If you'd like to come down front, I'd like to pray with you. If you'd like to join our church, we'd love to have you come down front and join our church uh, today. Amen.
told you I was going to surprise some of you. Um, I'm going to ask some of you to think back. Help me out. When's the last time we had a child come down front? I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm, one, I'm obviously I'm trying to make you cry, but I'm not trying to make you cry. I mean, do, I mean, is, is it been, it's been, a, it's been a minute, hasn't it? Anybody? At least an hour? Praise the Lord. It's been a year at least. Um, y'all, can y'all remember? Sue, do you remember? No, but it, it's been a little while, right? Several, several years at least, right? Um, I think that is it, less than one year ago, we started Sunday school back up for the first time. And a week and a half ago, we had 50 some in Bible, uh, vacation Bible school. And then we have a, a child come up front, give her heart to the Lord, and to be baptized. Dave, come up. Amen. It's good. We can do it. And they've come up to join the church through baptism also. So we're going to, we'll just be doing that next Sunday. We're going to, um, sorry, Mike and Penny Pendleton, Skylar. So, sorry, I didn't say that. But the, so we have some we're baptizing next week. If some of you are on the fence or some of you haven't been baptized, you need to get baptized. Um, what doth hinder thee? We, uh, that's a direct quote from King James. So, uh, seeing there is much water here next Sunday. I, when I would go preach revivals for people, the first thing I'd do is I'd go look in the baptistry. And I'd see if it was full or empty. And I'd see how much faith they had. Because if they didn't, if they didn't have it full, I'd preach about it during service. I'd call them out. You got the wrong preacher. You don't, don't want somebody to get baptized. So I'm so excited for the Pendletons, so excited for Kate and the Butler family and what's going on in their lives. Amen? Amen. Let's give all of them a hand to go. Would you please? Amen. Um, Paco, can you pray? You're, you're <laughs> <laughs> Father, as we sung today about your goodness, so good. We thank you for answered prayer. We thank you for those who have come to become a part of our family of God. I thank you for my granddaughter and the way she has accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Father, we know that you're not finished here. You have a great work to do. Let us be found faithful. Let us be your hands and feet. May we share the love of Jesus with everyone we encounter. And everyone said, you are dismissed or we can celebrate. God is good all the time, all the time.